We're jumping back into Nehemiah and um, they're still in the progress of the wall. They've not quite got it done yet. And there's some things that come up. Um, we're in chapter uh, 6. And if you want to head there, if you have your Bible, it'll be on the screen as well. But um, as I was preparing the message, I, I, I went back to something I've said earlier in this message. But I don't know about you, but do you feel like, uh, like your life, like your walk with the Lord is constantly under attack? Or like the church is being attacked by society and, and things just seem to be stacking up against us? Uh, I, I feel like every truth we hold dear as Christians, everything the Bible says, every, everything the Bible clearly defines is being attacked and trying, uh, and, and people are trying to destroy that. Uh, marriage and family and people's God-given identities and the value of the unborn, the importance of hard work, the blessing of sex, and on and on and on we could go. You add to the, those attacks just kind of like out of the media. You can add to that some workplace attacks or maybe social media attacks when we take a stand or we say something that someone doesn't like and all of a sudden we're declared hateful or we're declared shameful or we're declared intolerant of other people. I was thinking about all those things and I realized that those are just a few of the attacks that may be coming our way. Um, but we are also under a constant attack by evil forces. The evil forces that are trying to stop us. In fact, in Ephesians it says that our battle is not with human beings, but with evil forces ahead of us. And so in 2 Corinthians 2, this is what we are told. It says, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil Schemes. I just want you to understand, in our world, and it's always been this way, but, but Satan has always been trying to outsmart us. He's always been trying to scheme against us. So what are we going to do about it? How do you keep from being pulled into Satan's uh, attacks? How do, you, how do you keep from being driven off course by the schemes that he brings forth? How do we keep from allowing our, our faith to be shipwrecked, to be broken up? Well, Nehemiah has some of the best responses I've ever seen. And so as we read our text this morning, I would encourage you to pay clo close attention to what Nehemiah does. So if you are there, uh, Nehemiah 6, starting verse 1, I'm going to read 14 verses for you. So here we go. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab... And the rest of the enemies found out that, that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors and the gates. So Samballat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending this message to them. I'm engaged in a great work, so I cannot come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time, Samballot's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. There is a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me it's true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem proclaim, to proclaim about you, look, there is a king in Judah. You could be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. You are making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us. Imagine that imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. Later, I went to visit Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the grandson of Methabel, Meth who was confined to his home. He said, let us meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the doors shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. But I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? 
No, I won't do it. I realized that God has, had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. Then they, could, then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. Remember, oh my God, all the evil things that Tobiah and Sanballat have done. And remember, Noadiah, the prophet, and all the prophets like her who have tried to intimidate me. We come to this text in Nehemiah. And I know we feel the attack in our society. I, I know we, we feel like we're under the gun, but, but I want you to understand that Nehemiah had to endure so much more than what we have to endure, at least at this point. They, they start by trying to distract him from the, 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 the work and, and trap him. In fact, they've got the wall done, but they haven't put the gates and the doors in. I mean, the gates in the, uh, into the holes. And so uh, they're, they're trying to get him. They, they want him to come out and talk with them so they could kill him. When he didn't do that, they did. They said that multiple times, four times. Then they started to slander him. So they're trying to drag his reputation through the, through the mud. And this slander was meant to bring about a threat. They're saying, hey, hey, we're going we're to let people know that you are against the actual king. And then they, when that didn't work, they, they tried to use fear against Nehemiah. They tried to, to try to make him fearful so that he would go in the temple and lock himself in and sin so that they could discredit him. They were using every tool of attack. They were using intimidation. They, they were using character assassination. And, and they just didn't stop. They just kept on going and kept on going and kept on going. And I just want to let you know that if you're trying to accomplish God's work, that's, that's what's going to happen. People are going to try to intimidate you to stop. If that doesn't work, then they're going to try to discredit you and drag you through the mud. They're going to do everything they can to stop God's work. John Ort Ortberg, who's a preacher and an author, he uh, wrote about this uh, fictitious manual for the Peace Corps uh, if they were heading to South America, this fictitious uh, manual was telling them advice on how to handle an encounter with an anaconda. So if they came at, at, they were confronted with an anaconda, this is what they were supposed to do. And so at the top of the, the, uh, the uh, manual, it said this, what to do if attacked by an anaconda. Number one, if you're attacked by an anaconda, do not run. The snake is faster than you are. Number two, lie flat on the ground. Number three, put your arms tight at your sides and your legs tight against one another. Number four, the snake will begin to climb over your body. Number five, do not panic. <laughs> Woo, that's going to be a hard one. Number six, the snake will begin to swallow you from the feet end first. Number seven, step six will take a long time. <laughs> Number eight, after a while, slowly and with as little movement as possible, reach down, take, your, take out your knife, and with very gently slide it into the snake's mouth, and then all of a sudden, cut off the snake's head. Number nine, be sure your knife is sharp. Number 10, be sure you have a knife. <laughs> now, John Ortberg's really making a very serious point here. He, he, he's reminding us that you, you don't really know what's coming in life. You, you don't know what's going to happen to you. You don't, you don't know what you're going to be called to face. But you will be called to face something. And you need to be ready for it. In fact, he says... If you wait until an attack comes, because it will come, you have waited too long. You need to have prepared first. That's why we're looking at Nehemiah 6. The attacks are coming. I guarantee they're coming. And the question is, how are you going to respond? You better be prepared in advance to respond to those attacks. 
If we're trying to do God's will, and we are, if we're trying to promote and grow the kingdom, and we are, if we're standing firm in the truth and stepping out in faith, and we are, then attacks will come. And they are. So how do we prepare ourselves this morning? Nehemiah is a great example, and I want to look at his example this morning. So here it is. The first thing we need to understand is the attack. They will try to distract. We don't respond and stay focused. That, that's what Nehemiah does. Now, I know he does respond a little bit, but he doesn't really respond that much. Sambalat, to, so, Tobiah, and Geshem see that the wall is nearly finished. And, and so the, they're trying their very best to distract Nehemiah from the job. They're trying to pull him into a trap. But I love, I love Nehemiah's response here. He says, essentially, hey, I'm too busy. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bite. I'm not going to bite. I, I know you're making accusations. I know you're trying to distract. I know you're doing all these things, but you know what? I'm, I'm not going to bite. But, but they don't give up. They don't give up. They're, they're, and, and by the way, the attacks that are coming against us will not stop at the first one. They're going to continue. They're like, well, let's just talk about it, Nehemiah. I'm sure that we can compromise and find some kind of happy medium that we can all be, get a, you know, be, in, be for. A, a, a conversation is all we're really asking for. And Nehemiah pretty much says, nope, too busy. Not even going to talk to you about it. Not going to listen. I know it's a trap. I know you're trying to stop me. I know you want to eliminate me. So we're not even going to talk. I'm not even going to justify your accusations or I have a conversation with you. I'm just going to stay focused on the work. Nehemiah essentially says nothing. Not responding, not engaging, not going to allow myself to get distracted. By the way, those things seem to happen continuously. You know, people wanting to distract us from the work. They may not even know that's what they're trying to do, but they're doing it. And we, we spend an inordinate amount of time trying to explain something, and we ought to just say, you know what? Too busy. Got to keep working. Got to keep doing the job. Got to keep serving the Lord. I like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. He says, <clears throat> yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. This is what he says. I'm not because I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. Now, I love what Paul says. He says, you know what? I have to preach the good news. I'm compelled to preach the good news. God has called me to preach the good news, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to preach the good news. By the way, as a Christian, guess what you've been called to do? Preach the good news. And you should be compelled. Like, you can't do anything but Proclaim the good news. You have got to do it. I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy, Colonel George Washington Goethals. He was the man responsible for completing the Panama Canal. He had all sorts of problems, the climate, the geography, but the biggest challenge he had was growing criticism back home from those who predicted that he'd never finish the project. So he's having all these people criticizing him and they say, he never finished. He's never going to get it done. Finally, a colleague asks him, he says, aren't you going to answer these critics? In time, answered Goethals. When, his partner asked, when the canal is finished. When the canal is finished. That's when I'll, that's when I'll answer them. When it's done. Matthew 26. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus remained silent. I'm just going to let you know, sometimes the best thing you can possibly do is remain silent and keep your eye on the goal. Keep your eye on the mission. Because you can't convince some people, so you just keep on trucking. They weren't wanting to talk. They were wanting to distract. Second thing, they tried to defame the defamation technique. This is what Nehemiah does. We reveal the truth and we stay focused. They send out an open letter accusing Nehemiah and the Jews of treason. 
And then they say, and the king's going to hear about it. Now, an open letter really means this. They leaked information out there. They leaked out information so that other people could see it. They were trying to get the people to realize that they had these people claiming that Nehemiah was treasonous and that anyone who got caught up in this work would be considered treasonous too. They're wanting the people, for the Jewish people, to place pressure on Nehemiah so that he'll stop the work. That's what they're doing. They're trying to get into the people's heads more than they are to try to get into Nehemiah's head. And I love what Nehemiah says. That's a lie, and you're a liar. That's what he says. That's a lie, and you're a liar. <laughs> That's not true. And by the way, he goes on to say, and we're going to keep working on the Lord, on the, on the work of the Lord. And then what I love what he says is, and not only are we going to keep working for the Lord, but we're going to do it now with even more determination. I'm more determined than ever. Instead of letting their lies discourage him, he lets their lies motivate him. I don't know about you, but I've noticed this. One of the best ways to motivate a child, or, or myself, is to say, I bet you can't do it. I bet you can't. I bet you can't do it. And all of a sudden, you tell me that, and it was, I will, I will do it or die trying to do it. At least that's how I used to be. I still am, just to be honest with you. <laughs> I bet you can't. I bet I can. You watch me. Now, that could be a very bad thing if I'm focused on myself, which some, lots of times I am. But it's a very good thing if you're focused on God. You're saying, I can't. I'm focused on God, so yes, I can. Oh, yes, I can. Peter and John, they're out preaching. Right at the beginning of the church, you know, early in the church's life, they're preaching, they heal a lame man, they're sharing Jesus. The Sanhedrin arrest him, which is their supreme court of the day. They bring them in. They want to silence them. They want to discourage them, want to, want to stop them. They say, stop talking about Jesus. This is what it says, Acts 4. So they called the apostles back in, commanded them to never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling others everything we have seen and heard. They're like, are you kidding me? You think I'm going to stop what God wants because you don't want me to do it? That's not going to happen. Sometimes the best thing to do is just proclaim the truth and keep on working and keep on working, which leads to their last attack. They tried to deceive. They tried to deceive. We need to recognize the trap and stay focused. Nehemiah is called in by this prophet to come and receive counsel. But when he gets there, the prophecy that he has given is designed to bring him fear and cause Nehemiah to enter the te uh, temple, which would discredit him in a few different ways. First of all, he realizes that, that a good leader wouldn't run away from a problem in the first place. Second of all, if he goes into the temple, he's going to be sinning. And he's not going to do that either. So either way, it is a problem. But as he listens, Nehemiah quickly recognizes who's pulling the strings. He understands that they want him to look like a weak leader. And so he says, no, nah, that, that's not going to happen. I, I'm not going to do that. You know, this is one of Satan's go-to techniques. He's always done this technique. It's always, you know, if you do it this way, it'll be easier. If you go this direction, it'll make it, make it easier. I mean, I know that's not what God wants me to do, but, but if I did it this way, it'd be so much simpler. You remember Jesus was baptized. He goes up out into the wilderness, and this is what it says in Matthew 4. It says, Next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scripture says you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You know, do you see what Satan's trying to do? Satan takes Jesus up there 
He shows him the whole world, essentially, and he says, you know what? If you do it my way, you're not going to have to suffer. If you do it my way, it's going to be so much easier. If you do it my way, you still get the same results. Everybody's going to look to you as the great and mighty Messiah, but, but you're not going to have to do it in a way that's going to be hurtful or painful or sacrificial on your behalf. Why don't you do it my way, Jesus? And Jesus says, <laughs> nope, I'm not doing it your way because I worship God and I'm going to do it his way. I'm always going to do it God's way. I was on Facebook the other day. Flip through, I got this, this ad that some of your all's names was on. They said you, that you rec recommended or something. I don't know if it's really true or not, but because they, you know, anything on Facebook is absolutely true. We know that, but... <laughs> But I thought that might, might be a, you know. But anyway, I, I don't know if the camera's looking at me, but all of a sudden I'm getting these ads for these, these gummies that promote weight loss. So I'm thinking the camera can see me. <laughs> and, 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 and these gummies were on Shark Tank, according to the advertisement on there. And, and on the advertisement, they have these pictures of people Drastic weight loss. I mean, you're like, whoa, man, that is awesome. And I'm tempted to buy them because I'm thinking eating candy and losing weight is the way to go. I mean, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, you give me something sweet and I'll, let, yeah, I'm all about it. It's so much easier to eat a gummy than to exercise and watch what I eat. The truth is, it was a scam, by the way. <laughs> I've been eating those gummies for months, and nothing <laughs> has happened. <laughs> These people were out there trying to take your money and my money. They were trying to get us trapped so that you could just uh, keep billing us. You know what? That's, that's what? that's what Satan, that's what this world is trying to do. That's what Satan is doing. He's trying to get us deceived into believing that, that he's got an easier way. And we've got to stay focused on the work and keep moving toward the goal. Now, I want to read you the last part of this chapter. This is what it says, 15 through the end. So on October 2nd, the wall was finished just 52 days after it had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. During those 52 days, many letters went back and forth between Tobiah and the nobles of Judah. Uh, excuse me. And the nobles of Judah. For many in Judah had sworn allegiance to him because his father-in-law and Shechaniah, son of Erah, and his son Jehoahan uh, was married to the daughter of Meshulun, son of Barakiah. They kept telling me about Tobiah's good deeds, and then they told him everything I said, and Tobiah kept sending threatening letters to intimidate me. When you stay focused, the work of the Lord is ultimately done, and it brings God glory, and it reveals to all those critics who was involved in it in the first place. But there's two things you need to recognize as we close, and that is this, Nehemiah only said what he needed to say. No more, no long discussions, and he kept working. And the second thing is this, the attacks on Nehemiah came from outside, but also from inside. The attacks came from outside and from inside. And these techniques that Nehemiah uses are good in either case. Erwin Lutzer talked about an animal channel show he was watching. There was a herd of buffalo, and there were six lions on this uh, show, this program. The lions were looking for a buffalo dinner. They found one buffalo that strayed away from the herd a little bit, uh, and so they went after it. And you might be thinking, well, how does a few lions take down a buffalo? Well, one lion grabbed one back ankle, the other one grabbed the other back ankle, and they just held on, and eventually the buffalo wore down and stopped. 
And then another lion hopped on its back while another lion went for its stomach. And you can kind of guess what happens from there on. Now, what he said was this. He said, but, but here's what shocked me. He says, there were perhaps 100 buffalo, if not more, all standing and staring and watching this all go down. He says, I don't, I don't know if a buffalo can think. But if a buffalo could think, you know what they're thinking. Boy, am I ever glad that's not happening to me. He said, but, but what if? Imagine if the herd had decided they were not going to let those lions get away with this. And together they ran thundering toward them with their horns down. He said the lions would have scurried away immediately. The lions would never have a buffalo for lunch if the buffaloes stuck together. So for me, I'm thinking this. There's a lesson here. <clears throat> First, don't let Satan separate you from the herd, from the church body. But second, and more important, God's family is unstoppable if we work together on this common goal of advancing God's kingdom. God's family cannot be stopped if we're working together and the Lord's will for his kingdom. You know what? I believe God is doing something great right here, right now. I think God has got that in store for you and me right in this moment in time. And he wants you and me to embrace his lead, his will, and go all in with him. Just, we're here. We're in. What you ask, what you want, what you call me to do, I'm, I'm, I'm there. And as that happens, as we do that, I know Satan will attack. And so here's my call. And I think you can get it from Nehemiah. Say little. Do more. And stay focused. Say little. Do more. And stay focused. We pray with me. God, I thank you for all you bless us with. We come right now recognizing that you are mighty and great and worthy of praise and also recognizing that we live in a world that has denied you and pushing you as far as they can out of their lives, trying to remove the church if they could. If they could. So Lord, I pray for each of us here, as we get attacked for our beliefs, as we, as we stand on the truth and proclaim the good news, I pray, Lord, I pray that we will follow in Nehemiah's footsteps, whether they're trying to deceive us or defame us or distract us, whatever, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that we will not allow those attacks to win, but we will be people that follow you serve you, love you, and are committed completely to you. And Lord, in that, I pray that not only will we do that individually, but we'll do that as a body together, standing shoulder to shoulder and side by side because we love you and we want more and more people to come and know who you are. Lord, thank you for Jesus, our only hope, the one through whom we have found peace and forgiveness and grace. We love you and praise you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.